I am delighted to once again be with Professor of Law uh, Bruce Party from Queen's University. He's also the Executive Director of Rights Probe, and he's such an insightful, stabilizing presence in an increasingly turbulent and many days toxic <laughs> sort of political, cultural, uh, legal atmosphere. So Bruce, thank you so much for being here today. Oh, thanks, Julie. Always great to talk to you. Thank you. <laughs> you know, I invited you because I want to talk about the recent abortion ruling out of the US, but not to have a moral discussion, though, as a caveat, I do think we need more of that. I do think we need more, you know, serious, rigorous, thoughtful, respectful, metaphysical, moral engagement with big issues like this. And also, I don't know what your beliefs are about it. And I don't think I've told you what I think. And that's good. That's I think that's kind of not the point today. But what I really want to do is hear from you, a legal expert, um, to, to help us understand, OK, what has happened here? What what is this decision? Where did it come from? What does it mean for issues of freedom, both in America, as you see it, but most pertinently in Canada? Right. So can we can we get right into that? We've we've we heard. I mean, how long ago was it now that we heard there was this leak that this decision was going to come on the horizon? This uh, Dobbs versus Jackson. Right. Yes. Yes. And well, the leak itself was an event because hmm. that's just not supposed to happen. I mean, <laughs> I don't think anybody's actually identified who it was or how it happened. But the mm -hmm. idea that I don't want to get too far down this road, but but the idea that that private deliberation deliberations between the judges on the Supreme Court of the United States could be leaked uh you know was quite a quite an extraordinary thing so mm. uh, but but the decision itself of course has been the subject of a whole lot of of commotion mm -hmm. um and abortion is one of the most difficult legal issues around mm. um on a lot of on a lot of legal issues, I'm inclined to think that that the sawing off that's done, you know, the balancing between interests and the and the and the the, the finding of the mushy middle on a lot of things is really not a principal way to go about things. So let me give you an example. On free speech, uh, some people say, well, yes, free speech, you have free speech, but but you shouldn't be allowed to say things that are not that, that are that are detrimental to the community. Okay, well. For my money, that that doesn't make any sense at all. Either you have free speech or you don't, in the sense that you're allowed to say anything you want, except where it violates the rights of somebody else. So, for example, you're not allowed to utter threats because other people are have a right not to not to be subject to violence, and mm -hmm. so on and so forth. But the, but the sawing off that says, well, yes, this, but also that, mm -hmm. is really not a not a not a very principled way of going about things. But on abortion. The polarization of the two extreme views is, you know, it's difficult to justify either one of those positions because of the particular situation that you're in. So if you want to uh, describe those extreme positions, one is abortion is should, you know, should be unlawful under any circumstances from the from the moment of conception. Mm -hmm. And the other version is, of course, that everybody has a has a a right to get an abortion up until the moment of or even the moment after birth mm -hmm. right mm -hmm. and 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 there are people who hold those two polarized positions of course but i don't think that either one of those two positions is is easily defended on principled grounds even uh because of the particular situation that we have here of one human being with rights and freedoms uh, inside of which is a growing other potential human being. Mm -hmm. And that development takes place over time. And the more time that passes, the more like a human being that that entity becomes. And so it becomes a very difficult moral, but also legal difficulty. Mm -hmm. So to, to Dobbs itself. Well, I'm very, just to pause you, I'm very happy to hear yeah. you say that because I think, you know, morally speaking, with someone with a background in ethics, it always makes me very unsettled when someone on either side of the debate says, well, the abortion issue is settled because it's right. just such a complicated metaphysical issue that's mired in so many, not just metaphysical issues, issues of identity, but issues to do, to do with rights and freedoms and harms and that, you know, even if we feel that we've gotten to the right decision, to feel that it's just settled is, I think, a morally squeamish 
uh, sort of uh, difficult position to hold. And I wouldn't want to say it's in principle impossible, but when you see that when you see that view flung around on social media on either side, right, right. you feel like a bit. Let, let's let's hold. Let's calm down. Let's get some tethers in the ground, um, and let's do that. Like when we read, you know, right at the very beginning of this judgment is very clear. This is Justice Alito who has written the judgment, right? Who's yes. one of the conservative yes. members of the, of the Supreme Court, right? right. Um, and and what it says specifically, and this is not a, a claim about about the morality of abortion, right? This is a claim about the constitutionality of abortion rights. Right. So he writes, the constitution does not confer a right to abortion. Roe versus Wade, which was 1973, I believe, mm -hmm. almost 50 yep. years old now, and the case Planned Parenthood versus Casey, which was in the 90s, are overruled. And that's in virtue of the fact that this ruling determines that abortion is not a constitutional right, correct? Right. And that's what Roe v. Wade did, essentially, 1973. So Roe v. Wade came, comes along and says that on the basis of the words in the Constitution, the court finds the existence of a constitutional right hmm. to abortion. Now, just to, just to uh, clarify, I mean, they're not, it would be easy to misinterpret that as a right a positive right to have abortion provided to you, but that's not really what they mean. And what they mean is they, they you you have the right to be free to seek an abortion without being punished by the state. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Right, and they did so on the basis of of certain words in the Constitution, and they refer to several amendments. But the primary one, and the one certainly focused on in Casey that you referred to, is the Fourteenth Amendment. And and. Let me just let me just read you the, the, the key words of the 14th Amendment upon which it was argued that a right to abortion exists. The words are quite simple. It goes, nor shall any state deprive any person of life, liberty, or property without due process of law. That's it. That that's all the 14th Amendment says upon which the Supreme Court in Casey and in, in Roe v. Wade uh, found that there was a right to an abortion on the basis primarily of the liberty reference there. Mm -hmm. Now, the court in Dobbs, the recent one, basically says, well, that's just pulling things out of thin air. There was no right to an abortion before 1973. There was nothing in the, in the common law. There's no tradition or history of it in the United States. You guys are just making stuff up mm -hmm. and therefore rowan wade is wrong in its conclusion that there is a a, a right to abortion or, or i can put it this way a freedom to have abortion in in the u.s constitution well i'm glad I, over i'm glad i didn't just miss something because I, I i figured that out this morning that this was about the 14th amendment so i thought well let me look that up and then i thought well just to make things quick for myself i'll do a little word search is the word abortion in it no right. barely are the words private or privacy or but it's very much about persons and the status of persons uh, not right. uh, metaphysically not in terms of gestation and and development but um citizenship and, and things like that so um it would be a very interesting legal exercise to look more closely at how that 14th Amendment got argued to the claim that it justifies a right to abortion. But it certainly isn't obvious, is it? It's not. No, it's not obvious. But of course, this is a perennial um, battle between different judicial philosophies in constitutional interpretation. And we have this battle going on in Canada as well, except, except mm. that in Canada, it tends to be resolved uh, more consistently on the other side. Uh, when I say the other side, I mean the other the other side from the one that Dobbs is on, hmm. and in favor of the one that Roe v. Wade is on. But the but the conundrum is this: the constitutions of both countries um, say a lot of things, but a lot of it is kind of vague. Hmm. And so when you have a word like liberty, the job of the court in these cases is to interpret well what what does that mean, and. And there are at least two battling philosophies. One says, look, it, you, 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 number one, you are committed to the text of the document, and therefore liberty means whatever it means, but you can't go outside the traditional um, meaning of liberty. It's very to make literal. It literal. literal. It's, it's, it's sort of a literal textual and, and in fact, original. I mean, the, the originalist camp belongs with this group as well. And basically they say, look, the, the, 
the intent of the document is reflected by the intent of the framers at the time of the, the document was was produced. That doesn't mean that you can't, uh, you know, apply it to modern circumstances in a way that's consistent with those meanings. But essentially, you have to start there as opposed to starting with your own social situation and your own social values now to make up, you know, a new version of the Constitution. And the other side is the one that says, well, no, we 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 are entitled. The, the court is to to, and this is the Canadian version, the living tree version, but the, the, the Americans do this too, or certain of the of the uh, justices in the in the states do. They say, well, we, we need to adapt the meaning of the Constitution to take account of evolving social circumstances. But the other side would say, well, that's a license to do what you did in Roe v. Wade, but just to make stuff up. Uh, and so it is a conundrum, because you're giving the courts the job of interpreting the document. On the other hand, the document is really not that precise. And you don't want philosopher kings, you know, determining what your laws are, because that that's that's really bad news in terms of giving ultimate power to a unelected group of, of people. But that on the other hand, partisan, doesn't it? Because judges are appointed by particular political leaders and well, yes, it it tends to be well, it can be it can at time be part to be partisan or reflect a partisanship, but it's mm -hmm. it's even broader than that. I mean, it's political in the broad worldview sense, in the philosophical sense. I mean, when you it's, it, it evaluate judicial philosophies, do you believe in a in a in a judiciary that is restrained and mm -hmm. is committed to simply applying the law as as it is handed down, or do you believe in a judiciary that is 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 guiding? I mean, is the is the judiciary the 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 body that should lead us, you know, to paradise? Hmm. And that's that's, I mean, a, that's a lot of weight to bear. <laughs> I'm a, I'm overstating it a little bit, exaggerating, but but that essentially is the view, the predominant view in Canada, that the hmm. the, the court shall lead the way. So, for example, you know, on an issue like uh, gay marriage, it was the Supreme Court of Canada that said, no, no, gay marriage is what we have to have. And it was not the it was not parliament it was not the politicians and the politicians didn't want to didn't want to do it and they, and so what we have now is in many respects politicians that don't want to do the legislative task because they think well just just give it to the court and the court the court will will do it because they've done it in the past and they believe in this expansive reading of things when when it suits them not always but when it suits them so anyway so in roe v, v wade we have this expansive interpretation of of the 14th Amendment and, and other amendments uh, to create this uh, freedom to get an abortion. And what Dobbs has done is simply say Roe v. Wade is wrong. And in the U.S. federal system, it is the states that have the ability to legislate on this question, whereas in Canada, it, it is the federal government. So Parliament in the Criminal Code was the one who had prohibited place prohibitions on the ability to get an abortion, which was the sure. legislation in question in the Morgenthaler case. And we can get into that too, because the, yeah, the, the, you know, they're, they're... that in a minute, there's so much okay. to unpack here because, right. So the fact that uh, Dobbs Jackson rules the right to abortion, not constitutional, um, that means that the authority to regulate abortion is returned to the people and their elected Correct. representatives. Correct. So we can so, get to that. Yeah. Let's, let's just note. Let's, let's just note this. You know, one thing that Dobbs does not do is say there, there shall be no more abortions. Right. 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 So the 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 conclusion in Dobbs is not a substantive one in the sense that it is describing what the rule is going to be. Mm -hmm. What they are doing instead is identifying who shall make the rule, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. and they say okay. that job lies with the legislatures of the individual states. To yeah. Who, who are democratically elected and in each state they can make their own call. Good. Okay. So really, I mean, a number of important points so far. One, this is not really a moral judgment about the, you know, the ethical status of abortion. This also doesn't preclude the possibility of abortion in America. It just means that it is not viewed now as a constitutional right. You know, when this happened, I remember thinking, you know, why, why now? Why, why is this happening now after 50 years? 
Um, and then I started sort of thinking through that and parsing that question a little bit. And of course, one way to interpret that question is, well, why are we getting this particular decision now? Why are the judges, uh, was it 6-3, I think, voting in favor of this judgment, right? Um, why do we have that now? Whereas in Roe v. Wade, it was, it was the other way. But of course, what we should probably do is backtrack a little bit because why this judgment now? Well, this judgment now was instigated by the fact that there was a case that brought this into, into view, right? And this is the case uh, that has to do with the 2018 Mississippi law that I believe banned most abortions after 15 weeks. Um, and that Jackson's only abortion clinic sued the state health officer whose name is Thomas Dobbs in 2018 on the grounds that as uh, was argued in Planned Parenthood and Casey uh, versus Casey, a woman's choice for abortion before 24 weeks is protected by rights to privacy under the 14th Amendment to the U.S. Constitution. This, so this, this came before the courts because of a very particular suit, right? So that's one way to understand the why now question. Um, do you want to sure. say a little bit about that? Yes, well, uh, all, the, all, all of what you said is true. Uh, it's also, of course, a, a product of the, the makeup of the court right now, because you do have more conservative judges on the bench than you do liberal judges, which, which was not the case, certainly when Roe v. Wade was decided and hasn't been the case for a while. Hmm. Um, and so this was sort of the, the, the moment. And, and in a way, it's the moment that certain constituencies in the U.S. have been working towards. I mean, I, I, I think this has been part of the political agenda on the right uh, in the same way that the reverse was the political agenda on the left. And the abortion, see, one, one way, I mean, abortion is fascinating as a legal question because in some ways it, it, ref, it, it reflects, it, it sends the two warring sides back to their origin. The positions mm. that they do not hold on most other things today. Mm. Uh, if I can put it, uh, uh, let's put it this way. So conservatives uh, have been, you know, obviously not universally, I'm not talking about every single person, but I'm, but as a, as a, as a pattern, uh, tend to be those who today are skeptical, to say the least, about things like lockdowns and vaccine mandates and uh, and pronouns and speech restrictions and and censorship and so on any restriction on personal liberty they they've become they've become for the lack of a better term the the liberty party mm. <laughs> and the and the and the democrats the liberals uh are the ones who are in charge of the administrative state and who are imposing all of these restrictions in the name of Health and safety, both safety and physical in the in the health sense, and safety in the in the psychological sense about speech, about this, about that, and regulations here and there, and climate change and so on. You know, and they they've become they've become the the constituency of the iron fisted state. And yet, on abortion, the 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 democratic position is: How dare you interfere with me? And the conservative position is, no, th this really needs state supervision. And so it's actually kind of weird to compare those positions to their positions on an awful lot of other things that they now promote. Well, it's very we weird to say the least to see the my body, my choice slogan trotted out now when it has been nowhere yeah. over the last two years. Sure. Uh, and I think there's a very, I don't know if we have time for that discussion, but there's such an interesting question there in my mind about whether there's a hypocrisy to fall apart on these issues, right? So if you're against right. mandates, must you also right. defend pro the pro-choice view? I think right. this, I don't think that's obviously true. I think there's a more complex uh, analysis that's required there, but I do think there's a, um, a hypocrisy at worst, maybe, and a, and, a, and a kind of myopia, not to see that, th they're, that they're both issues to do with <laughs> bodily autonomy, and that we need well, to engage with them both seriously, right? Yeah, well, not to, not to go too far down this road, but my, my theory has been uh, that, so people think of this, and I've described it in this way, that there are sort of two sides fighting, mm. the conservative and the, you know, the, the, the progressive, if I can use that label. 
Mm -hmm. And I don't think that's true. I think there are three. And the third are, can, 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 the third consists of sort of the original liberals, the original classical mm -hmm. genuine liberals. And the progressives and the conservatives are both, both collectivists. They both have collectivist inclinations. The conservatives mm -hmm. uh, on some things, and the progressives on other things, and they're, they, 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 don't get me wrong, they do not disagree, they do not agree at all, mm -hmm. at all, about most of their positions. But they're both inclined towards a collectivist view on certain things, whereas the classical yeah. liberals, they, they not interested in collectivism. They, they think down the line that, you know, you, you leave it to the people themselves to figure out for themselves. If they want to do this, then they can go ahead. I don't, in other words, don't tell me what to do. And, uh, you know, I, I think I, we have a discussion about that, this, this three, we, we should talk about that in another, yeah, yeah. another time, because that's, I think, very interesting yeah. and underlying a lot of, a lot of what's going on. But let, let's do, let's, let's do something fun and conceptual for a minute and pull back and, and just think okay. about, now, maybe this is going to be different for the American and Canadian context, I'm not sure. But sure. the question is, what does it mean to say that a citizen has a constitutional right to something? Right. Okay. So, um, let's let's take free speech as an example. Mm -hmm. If you have a right to free speech, then the traditional interpretation of that constitutional right is that it is essentially a freedom, the right to be free from interference from the government. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So that means the government sure. cannot censor you. It does not mean that the government owes you a platform. Mm -hmm. You know, a, 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 a place to publish or a microphone or a stage or an audience or anything of that nature. So if you go and you try and get your views published somewhere or post it on the web and nobody will do it, mm -hmm. you don't. too bad. No, that's, that's not part of the right. The right is you, you're allowed to go to the proverbial um, soapbox in the park and say your piece. But if nobody comes to listen, you know, that's just too bad. Are all constitutional rights negative rights? Not way. all of them. Not all of them. Uh, you can point to some things in the charter that are not, but most of the sort of fundamental freedoms are, and that's sort of the nature of the freedom. There's one interesting exception in 2D of our charter. There is the freedom of association, mm. which you would think is, is also a negative freedom. In other words, you, you can gather with whomever you wish, but you don't have the, you know, the, the right to uh, a, 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 the right to be facilitated in that you have to find your own people right but your own tent it, probably. right <laughs> your own tent you have to find your own tent but uh in uh, the supreme court of canada basically said in a labor case that 2d includes a kind of positive right to have a legislative regime that provides for collective bargaining so as to facilitate that very thing, the, the formation of unions and the, the, the bargaining for the employees as a whole. And that doesn't mean that you have to have a union in every workplace. It just means that there has to be available a legislative scheme by which that can be accomplished, which is further in the positive direction than a normal negative right. It, it sounds to me like, and, and again, I'm not making a, a claim about the moral status of abortion, but my understanding of the judicial issues at stake here is that it sounds like it was Roe v. Wade that was out of step with what Supreme Court decisions are really allowed to be on these, on these questions. And, and if yeah, that's well, true, mm -hmm. unless we see more of a move towards a positive rights interpretation of the Constitution and more of a move towards what you were talking about before in terms of the, the, the judges seeing it as their responsibility not to interpret the Constitution literally, but rather to make it more malleable in terms of the you know, cultural issues that arise, that we might not um, see a reversal of this decision. Well, so as I, as I alluded to earlier, this is, this, is, this is a matter of great dispute 
uh, in terms of judicial philosophies. And of course, judicial philosophies well, are grounded. were significant, you noticed. There's a lot of leeway. Uh, uh, <laughs> <laughs> right. Well, so if so, if, if you're inclined to think that Dobbs is correct mm -hmm. in saying that Roe v. Wade was wrong, that likely reflects your judicial philosophy that mm -hmm. the courts should be limited to applying the law and not making it. Mm -hmm. But there are a lot of people who say, no, no, we, we have to have courts making the law because the legislatures won't do it right. Mm -hmm. and, and, and we endorse um, the idea. And, and this is especially true in Canada, uh, of course, because it's safe, it's safe for a particular constituency to believe this because, again, you know, not not all judges have the same philosophy. There are lo there's there, there's lots of of individuality amongst our judges on the bench. This is the way it should be, but for the most part in Canada, we have a judiciary which is inclined to a progressive point of view, and that means it's safe for progressives to think, well, we'll just give it to the courts because the courts will do what we think is right, and so. That, that happened, for example, well, with respect to a whole bunch of, of individual issues. So, so you can see cases through the years in which certain provisions are, are interpreted expansively so, so as to expand rights in certain directions, but not always because it's not always a particular kind of cause that's in question. And in those situations, some of the courts revert to, oh, no, that's not what it says. You can't because have your cake and it, too. It's not, it's not a cause they want to champion. Right. So, the, as I say, the, the the danger in that approach is it means that you really don't have very many boundaries mm -hmm. uh, uh, set around what a court is able to do, even in contra uh, indication of what the, of what the voters have said or the the government that the voters have elected. Mm -hmm. uh, so, I mean, to, to, if you wanted to put it cynically, uh, one way to put it is look. This is all these, these are all just trappings to legitimize a political struggle inside a country so as to give the mark of validity to it, what is actually just an exercise of power. And and that that doesn't apply just in one direction, it applies in all directions. I mean, how how do you decide when a law is valid, besides you know, having an election and having the law properly passed and voted on and so on? In terms of the substance of it, when it goes to a court and you have a constitution that's kind of vague, you know, what is the right what is the criteria for deciding that this is going to be the rule that we all have to follow? And by the way, we all have to follow on punishment of being forced by the state to do so in terms of fines and imprisonments. And mm -hmm. and and that's that's the characteristic that is always in play here that people don't want to see, which is every single law, every single law is backed with the force of the state. So law is really violence. Without violence, you don't have law. So every single law has, the, the, people, the person who has put that law into place, whether it's a legislature or a court, has unconsciously or consciously made the judgment that this is so important that we are going to, to take the violence of the state and make people do it, or not do it, as the case may be, uh, and, and that that's 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 quite a step to take in a country that purports to be free. You know, it makes me very curious about what has gone on, what will go on culturally. I mean, you bring up the issue of freedom. How will we think about freedom moving forward? Not just because of this decision, but just because of other things that are going on in the world right now. There was something very interesting in the judgment very early on, section two, and Justice Alito wrote, uh, and he said one of the things they were considering was whether the right to abortion is rooted in the nation's history and tradition. I thought that was very interesting. Is that a standard component of, of, of a case like this that considers whether X is a constitutional right? And then yes. um, I, I, didn't, uh, I didn't have a chance to get too far into that, but can you speak to that, that issue? Sure, so that's one of the criteria in play about whether you can interpret the words in the 14th Amendment, for example, to include mm. abortion or mm -hmm. whether or not it is rightfully excluded. If, if there's not that kind of history, you know, through through time from, from origin to the present day or to 1973, mm -hmm. uh, then there's there's less to justify interpreting 
those words so as to, to include this thing. I mean, they uh, Alito is including that section of analysis in the case so as to help make the point that the court in Roe v. Wade just pulled the thing out of the air. And mm -hmm. there's no there's no sort of historical foundation for it in the same way there's no textual foundation for that finding. Mm -hmm. Very, I, I was curious about what it would mean to find those sorts of roots uh, in the nation's history. And so would the judges consider um, whether the language of abortion, whether put explicitly like that or in some other more indirect terms was prominent in in, in the law in the 18th, 19th centuries, in literature, in, in, in the legal code, in policies? I mean, is that the kind of thing they would be looking at and considering? Uh, yes, they'd be looking, sure. They'd be looking at, uh, well, one thing they looked at is, is the common law. Mm -hmm. uh, you know, through time, was did the common law generally um, prohibit abortion or or were there protections in order to make it available? And the court's conclusion is no, there were there were common law crimes and prohibitions on it through time, you know, not universally the same at all moments. But if you're trying to trace justification for the holding in Roe v. Wade in the history of the common law, then the case that they're making is, you know, you don't have very much to work with. Um, I've, I've read, a, it seems like there are, there's a lot online about whether or not this judgment is the result of an activist court. Do you have mm. a view about that? I'm sure that the losing side would say that. <laughs> I mean, the uh, winning, Judge right, Thomas the win voted. Well, the winning, the winning side, uh, their position is that Roe v. Wade was the activist decision. Mm -hmm. And this is the one that simply sets the record straight. Um, I mean, I, I'm, I'm personally not in favor of judges having a free hand to interpret at will. I mean, I'm no fan of the living tree here in Canada. I think that's, I think that is used to create, well, it's resulted in arbitrariness, I think, from case to case, rather than the idea that, that the judges are restrained by the text that they're given. And their primary job is interpretation as opposed to creation. Now, of course, people are going to say, lawyers are going to say, well, interpretation involves a creative aspect. And that's true. You know, it's very difficult to, to find words that have no ambiguity in them at all. Mm -hmm. But it's a matter of, of scope and degree, I think. And the, the difference in the philosophies, I think, could be seen in the way the philosophies are stated. The, the textualists would say that the objective is to apply the law as it's written, mm -hmm. you know, and, and there's going to be ambiguities and you do your best to figure out what the, what the drafters meant and what the, what the, what, what the meaning of the word is and so on, uh, as opposed to the competing philosophy, which says outright, no, we, the, the court has license to adapt the meaning of the charter to changing social circumstances. I mean, in other words, in the words of Rosalia Bella, the Supreme Court should be, should be the final arbiter of which contested values in society should prevail, not the legislature, the court. Mm -hmm. And that, that, is, that is seizing uh, seizing control over the, the, the law of the country. One of the big concerns I know uh, among women on social media, especially, is that, and I think this is the most common comment I saw the day the judgment uh, came out, was women will die because of this. And I think what they're referring to is that, well, now medically necessary, what's considered to be medically necessary uh, abortions uh, that, if not done, would result in the, the loss of the mother's life will no longer be possible. Is that the case? Can you, I know we, we talked earlier about this uh, moving it to the particular jurisdictions. Mm -hmm. um, yes, well, I mean, engage with that uh, I, a little bit. I, I, I couldn't say, but uh, it's certainly a possibility because if, if this is not a constitutional freedom in the US mm -hmm. and if the individual states have the jurisdiction okay. to make the call themselves, well, some of the states are going to enact laws that are pretty restrictive. And there are think. 13, I think, trigger states in the U.S., right? Have we seen some of those laws 
well, I guess if I guess by definition they would have come into, into effect already, but uh, it'll be interesting, right. I think, to watch what happens in those contexts, right? And how right, and there's expected to be quite a wide range from mm -hmm. from state to state to state about what the restrictions are going to be. Mm -hmm. You know, which which so this is a really great legal question to to raise the issues about the so we've been talking about the balance of power, if you like, between legislatures and courts. Mm -hmm. But there is also the, the maybe even more fundamental question about the balance of power or control between individuals and the state, right? So, you know, so what, the, what the Supreme Court in, in Dobbs has done is, is give states, this is the way they would put it, they've given states back the constitutional authority that they've always they've always had, and that and that this is a reflection of a free country because now uh, the voters can elect state governments that will enact legislation that reflects the beliefs in the states about what the restrictions on abortion should be. Okay. On the other hand, that means that those populations of voters in those states can elect a government that will impose restrictions on individual women mm -hmm. who want to do a certain thing. And so the question is, well, it, th does majority rule make a law right? And now we're back to the morality of the question. But this is no simpler at the state level than it is at the national level. Right? No, it's not. No, no, it's not. It's not it's no simpler, except that, except that when Roe v. Wade, Roe v. Wade was in effect, that constitutional restriction um, applied and, and basically made a national standard mm -hmm. on a topic that otherwise would have been under state jurisdiction. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Right. Let's talk about Canada for a little bit. What, what effect, if any, do you think this will have on the Canadian context? Well, the Canadian context is a little different. Mm -hmm. Not not in terms of its fundamental, um, you know, the, obviously the issue itself, but the, but the way that the story has been told in the law is is kind of peculiar in a way. So we had, we the Supreme Court decided the Morgan Teller case in 1988, and a question there in question there was a section of the Criminal Code that made abortion essentially unlawful unless uh, you got authority from a a uh, a committee of of physicians. And Morgan Teller was being prosecuted for violating this provision and made a charter argument that it violated uh, section seven, the right to, well, liberty in this case, uh, life, liberty, security of the person, security of the person in, in respect of the, of the women. Um, and the court in Morgan Teller in a, in a, what was essentially a five to two split of this, the several different judgments. Um, so it's, it's a little bit sticky but essentially in a five to two judgment said, yes, these restrictions as they are formulated uh, infringe section seven, and they are not justifiable under section one because of the way they are put together. What they did not say is this, the Supreme Court of Morgan Teller does not say that, that, that section seven protects a right to abortion at any time. Mm. What they did say is that this committee thing that you've set up in the criminal code with this committee with the, with physicians won't do because it itself is causing harm or danger or risk to the health of women because it doesn't work very well. It's, 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 there's big delays in it. It's not available in certain places. If your objective is to protect health and safety, this is not going to do it. So you go back and fix this. We're not saying you can't have restrictions on abortion, mm -hmm. but the particular means that you've selected here just don't meet the threshold of the section one requirement. So what happened after that is nothing. So the section of the Supreme Court uh, of the criminal code has been struck and there's been basically nothing has been enacted ever since. So we, we, we nationally in the criminal code have no law about abortion. And that's not because hmm. there's a constitutional right to abortion, no questions asked, mm -hmm. at any time. That's, that is not what the Supreme Court said. Instead, 
what we have is a political class that does not want to touch. Now, there have been, been a couple of attempts that got, that came close, but but uh, nothing has actually been enacted. Now, just, just to give you some perspective on this, the one judge in Morgenthaler that was, I think, it's fair to say, most um, adamant about the violation of Section 7 rights, the one most inclined to, to protect the right to an abortion, was not as unequivocal as, as people might imagine. I just want to just just maybe want to read you just a very short passage. This is from Justice Wilson. And she wrote her own judgment in the case, although she was in result with siding with, with four of the other justices. And just, just listen to this. She says, the value to be placed on the fetus as potential life is directly related to the stage of its development. The undeveloped fetus starts out as a newly fertilized ovum. The fully developed fetus emerges ultimately as an infant. Now, here's the really important bit. This view of the fetus supports a permissive approach to abortion in the early stages where the women's autonomy would be absolute and a restrictive approach in the later stages where the state interest in protecting the fetus would justify its prescribing conditions. The precise point in the development of the fetus at which the state's interest in its protection becomes compelling should be left to the informed judgment of the legislature. Mm -hmm. Now that's interesting because she's essentially saying, yeah, this is a sticky, sticky wicket. It should be liberty at the beginning and not at the end, and where the line is, is a job for the legislator to decide. Now, that is a very middle of the road position to take. Mm -hmm. And, and it, 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 it's, it, it is neither one of the polarized positions. And, it, it, you know, because of the nature of the abortion issue, it mm -hmm. makes a lot of sense to me. Mm -hmm. And we're back to that, that recognition of the the moral and metaphysical challenges that are unique maybe to this particular part yes and, and the and the, the one question that nobody wants to answer and even the court don't in morgan teller they didn't they didn't really say because it's such a difficult problem and it's the one that wilson is alluding to but in section seven let me just let me read you just, just the the words of section seven to put this in context so section seven is very much, not, not exactly the same words, but it's very much like the words of the 14th Amendment. Section seven says, everyone has the right to life, liberty, and security of the person and the right not to be deprived thereof except in accordance with the principles of fundamental justice. But the key words I wanna focus on is, uh, are, everyone has the right to life, liberty, and security. Now, here's the question that nobody has answered. Does everyone include the unborn child? Mm -hmm. And if so, when? You know, what is it that defines when a person is a person? Is the fetus not a person until they emerge? Or is there a moment during the development inside the womb where legally, and we're talking legally here, where legally that entity becomes a person. There are this this question arises in all different kinds of areas of the law too. So in, mm. in, in negligence, for example, you know, if if a woman does something carelessly and harms the unborn child, and when the child is born, suffers from some kind of physical mm. ailment or the like because of the actions of the mother. Can that now child sue the mother for negligence? And the general rule has been no. Because, because number one, they weren't a person at the time, right? And allowing the child to do that now will infringe upon the mother's autonomy mm -hmm. before the child is born, right? Mm -hmm. But I mean, we got to get the ducks in a row. Oh, you you, you mm -hmm. got to be consistent about this. Otherwise, we're just sort of being arbitrary and 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 being being driven by uh, our 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 sort of emotional impulses and our political conflicts. 
I mean, there's no consensus about this within moral philosophy, I would say. There, there, there's a stalemate of sorts. And I think it's, it, I, I like to think it's just a testament to the difficulty of the question. But of right. course, in, in law, we don't have the luxury of avoiding it forever, do we? We have to engage right. with this and do our best somehow. Um, I do have one last question for you. It seems to me that when we're, when we're talking about in the American context, especially this uh, Dobbs-Jackson is, is separating a little bit um, the constitution from, from the people, the federal uh, regulatory bodies from, from, the, from the state. In Canada over the last two years, we seem to have seen very little separation, in my view anyway, between policy at the federal level and policy implemented at the provincial levels. And of course, various charges of collusion between you know, federal uh, political officials and provincial ones. Um, are, is there room in Canada now to see the kind of judgment that we're seeing it, this Dobbs-Jackson decision, which turns more power over to, in Canada, the provinces rather than regulation at the federal level? Or are we just not built that way right now? <laughs> I think that's the question. I would, I would, not, I would not expect uh, a Dobbs equivalence mm -hmm. from the Supreme Court of Canada at the moment. No, mm -hmm. I mean, we do have, we do. So there was a recent uh, decision out of the Alberta Court of Appeal that that essentially found the uh, federal government's um, new impact assessment act which makes it very difficult to build pipelines and other kinds of things by imposing federal criteria and review processes on projects that would otherwise be within provincial jurisdiction and the affirmative court of appeal said no 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 this is this is provincial jurisdiction you're encroaching uh, contrary to what the Constitution Act 1867 says. Mm -hmm. So, no, you can't do this. And that that decision, of course, will be appealed. Um, <laughs> it, it, resembles, it resembles a little bit, a little bit, it resembles the carbon tax case, which the Alberta Court of Appeal also said was an encroachment upon provincial powers. And the Supreme Court of Canada said, you know, no, too bad. Uh, it's part of the uh, peace, order, and good government residual power of the federal government. So, I mean, I, I wouldn't expect that pattern to change really, but it's the, it's, and it's not, and of course this demonstrates that, and, and nobody's made the case that all courts are on the same page all the time about things. That's not, that's not true. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. And, it's, and it's not the case that all three branches of government are on the same page about all things all the time. That's not true either. Mm -hmm. However, the, 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 the pattern has been, especially during the pandemic, that the three branches generally are on the same page uh, in terms of the necessity for pretty severe governmental, bureaucratic, technocratic restrictions in order to save us all from a respiratory virus. So the Ourselves. public health officials, the departments, the agencies, the regulators, the federal government, the provincial government, and for the most part, the courts, uh, there's no there's no real fighting going on between them on on these questions. This is so fascinating to me. It takes us a little bit outside of the abortion issue, but this question that keeps coming up in my mind, whether Canada is just doomed to be unavoidably separatist in some way, you know, whether or not we, whether or not there's something common enough among the people who see themselves as Canadians in order to forge ahead with a common identity that can settle these kinds of questions. And mm -hmm. I guess one benefit to turning over some of these decisions to the uh, at the provincial level is to allow people to maintain their Canadian citizenship while moving freely you know, from one province to another, depending on the laws in a place. But of course, then I think the question is, well, what, what does that do to our national identity if we are so different and so bifurcated and I I in that way? Well, you, you could put it another way, which is to say that federal systems like Canada and the US are, are terribly unlikely. Because you do have different groups of people, different different territories with different populations, with very different ideas about what's right, and you mm -hmm. split you split the areas of legislative jurisdiction between them, and not always the same way. The the, the split in the U.S. is different than it is in the, in, in Canada, mm -hmm. and so because you don't have a single government, but you have two layers of government, sometimes 
who agree and sometimes they don't. You know, is it is it possible over time for that kind of system to 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 survive? And so far, it's done pretty well, both especially in the states because it's been around for longer. But in Canada, we've sort of held on. But the but the 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 cracks and the tensions are becoming more obvious, and and uh, I think they're pretty getting pretty acute in Canada. There's there's this um, you know central Canada versus the West dynamic that's especially acute right now, mm-hmm. and um, we'll just see where it goes. Mm-hmm. There's, a, there's a determination on the part of the of the of what I, what are what are sometimes called the the Laurentians. The traditional power base, sort of Ontario, Quebec power base, who believe that, you know, Canada is what they um, uh, envision it to be, and anything that that diverts from that vision is is sort of alien and outrageous and shall not be permitted. We have layer upon layer of separatism now, right? We have, as you say, yeah. the West versus kind of the the Laurentians uh, and layering upon already the Quebec issue. And now we yeah. have kind of a mass exodus of people from the country itself. So it'll be very- well, there's that, there's, Yeah, there's a very there's a cartoon I saw the other day. I forget who I forget who, uh, who, who drew it, but there's a great cartoon. Was well, a cartoon or was a meme? Anyway, it's two panels, two panels, one of which said, you know, Prevent from the point of view of the federal government, um, you know, provincial powers boo when talking about Alberta, but provincial powers yay when talking about Quebec. Yeah, <laughs> there you have it, right. Bruce. Thank you so much. It's always rigorous and enlightening and civil when we talk, which is like a hot commodity these days. So thank you so much. And we're have, what are we having a conversation? Oh, about. Um, Modern liberals, classical liberals, classical liberals, and conservatives. We'll remember yeah. that. That'll be our next That's, chat. Okay. Let's do it. Let's do it. Thanks, Thanks Julie. <laughs> Bye. Thanks for hanging out with me today. If you enjoyed watching this video, please consider making a tax-deductible donation to the democracyfund.ca slash donate.